Hi, let me welcome back to the DB Tour course, chapter 13, the final video in our discussion of plan evaluation in MonoDB and PostgreSQL, and in particular, the Volcano Iterator style model that is implemented in PostgreSQL, the on-demand evaluation of a plan that only requests the next row at each time for delivery. Okay. Uh, what I would like to show you here is uh, one particular way to expose the behavior of the Volcano Iterator Style model on the level of SQL. So uh, we were talking about uh, the Volcano Iterator model in terms of plans and how plan operators forward the open, next and close AP calls, API calls to their subsequent plans and so on. But uh, you can uh, as well observe this uh, uh, the behavior of the on-demand query relation of the Volcano Iterator model on the level of SQL and very easily so and I think it's very insightful. Okay, so uh, to do that I would uh, like to introduce you to a concept in SQL that is called the cursor. Okay, cursors can be declared for particular queries. Okay, so I would declare a named cursor here. Okay, this is just an identifier that I would pick. I would declare a name cursor for one particular SQL query. Okay, and that cursor would actually navigate over the resulting over the resulting rows of this particular query. Okay, the query would return an entire result set of rows. A cursor would always point at one particular row, at one particular row of this result set, and I have statements to move that cursor one row ahead, another row ahead, maybe n rows ahead, or maybe n rows back. So I have really fine control about uh, what particular row of the result I would like to see, maybe only the next resulting row. And uh, this is exactly what cursors uh, can provide. So you see uh, that uh, this would just declare the cursor for further manipulation. I can even request that this particular cursor is able to move forwards and backwards in the result. This is not available for all sorts of queries yet, but uh, well, for most of the queries, I can even have a bidirectional cursor that can move forwards and backwards. And to move that cursor, there would be a different command, the fetch command. And normally I would just issue a fetch next command, the fetch next command to retrieve the one next row from the query result of our, of our query. Okay. Well, I can also request the uh, next n rows from the query result, but n would default to one here. I can even move backward. So all of these details are interesting. I would uh, refer you to the uh, manual pages of PostgreSQL. What this will give us is the opportunity to observe the system while it invests the time to only produce the next row. Uh, normally we, we uh, observe the system by uh, executing the eval routine that we've mentioned in the previous videos. The eval routine that would request all rows that the plant can produce. The fetch would only produce the next row. And if we time the fetch, we can have interesting insights in the behavior of the evaluation of individual uh, operators, whether they are blocking, whether they are pipelining, and so on. And we will do that over in the terminal in due course. Uh, and when, once we've done that, because such a cursor is a persistent thing that iterates over the result set, well, if it even gives me the opportunity to move backwards over the result set, you can imagine that those resulting rows would be buffered for me to release these intermediate buffers. Uh, well, we should issue a close cursor call to, uh, well, just to free resources and deallocate buffers. Okay, please be aware that these statements, the declare, fetch, and close statements have to be issued within one SQL transaction. So we have not talked about formally about SQL transactions. Uh, let me just state that these are sequences of SQL statements that are forming one uh, homogeneous, one, one uh, unique, uh, undivisible group of statements. So we would, uh, we would indicate to uh, PostgreSQL that such a group of statements would now begin, and we would also mark the end of such a group of statements. That's the uh, task of the commit statement. You will see that these statements uh, in the buffer 
that I will explore with you in a minute. Okay, so I think uh, let's do just that. It's, it's one other way to experience that indeed the Volcano Iterator model is doing its thing behind the curtains of PostgreSQL. All right. Here we are. This is the editor. This is our PostgreSQL setup with the one and many tables here. We've seen that bef we've seen these before. These are just the tables that you know. All right. So I would now enter one such transaction, one uh, uh, sequence of statements. Within such sequence, I can declare cursors, fetch from these, and then also deallocate these cursors, close them again. So let me start this uh, sequence of statements here. There we are. In my prompt, you can see, due to this asterisk here, we have actually entered such a sequence of SQL statements. All right. First, uh, well, let, let's look at one particular query. It's a cell. It's a, no. It's an equi join query between the one and one and many tables, and we will would be joining on the A column here. All right, but this is not the interesting bit of this particular plan. The interesting bit, I would say, is the distinct keyword. Okay, so uh, well, we produce probably many many join pairs here, uh, but we will only we only are interested in distinct join pairs. And well, the semantics of the distinct operator can be implemented in many ways. Uh, for example, in terms of hashing or in terms of sorting. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, the system here will pick a sorting based uh, implementation of distinct. So in the plan that we will uh, look at here, we will probably find a sort operator, a blocking sort operator. Let's have a look at the plan. All right, so that plan, of course, scans the one and many tables. We uh, we thought so, and both are being uh, joined by using a hash join operator. Okay, so all of this is quite interesting, but I'm more interested in about this uh, this sort operation. Okay, to implement the dis the the distinct keyword, we would first sort the output of the hash join by this particular sort key. So that means by all the rows that are emitted by the SQL clause, by the select clause here, I'm sorry. Okay, so all of these fields would make up the sort key. We would sort the, uh, the, uh, the, the incoming rows and then output only unique rows. Well, this unique operator then really has a simple job to do because Duplicate rows will be adjacent in the sorted output, and uh, while well, throwing away duplicates then is rather simple. This is the strategy implemented by PostgreSQL to implement the distinct operator. And of course, we know that this is a blocking operator. And uh, well, let's see whether we can observe its behavior when we declare a curler for this query and then fetch the result of uh, the uh, of of this query row by row. All right. So, uh, well, let's declare a cursor for this same query. And it will be a cursor that we can move forward and backwards. Okay. And uh, we, well, we would just name that cursor pipeline here, but it could be called Ben Kenobi or Fubar or whatever. Okay. So we'll declare the cursor. Okay. So no query relation uh, or anything has happened. Uh, as you can tell, this went really quick. We only have to declare the cursor. Now the real work begins when we uh, perform this fetched next call. So show me the next, in this case, the first row of results that you can uh, retrieve from this, from this particular query. Well, uh, <coughs> if we, <coughs> I'm sorry about that. If we uh, request the first row, well, this would lead to the uh, forwarding of the requests to deliver the next row from the unique operator to the sort operator to the hash join, which will forward that to the sequential scans and so on. All of these will return their rows. And uh, well, the, uh, these operators will do their thing, but this sort, this sort cannot return before it hasn't seen all the rows, all the rows that have to be brought into a sorted order, only then we can return to the unique call to actually perform the, uh, the, the top level plan operator here. So let's 
perform the fetch next year and let's have a look at the time that is needed to perform the fetch next. All right, so that would be the first row. You see it's really indeed only a single row that is being returned here and that took like 1.8 seconds. Okay, 1.8 seconds for the first row. And for the next row, okay, 0 0.2 milliseconds. That's exactly the behavior of a blocking operator, of the sort operator in the plan. Before we could return that first row, the sort operator first had to execute the entire subplan below. And, uh, well, it had to collect all the rows, had to sort them all to bring them into sorted order, and only then the very first row of that in that sorted order could be returned to the unique call. All right, once we've done that, of course, the blocking sort operator has already done its job. All the sorted rows are being held in an intermediate buffer for us to uh, for us to uh, uh, to extract the next results from. And this extraction of the next result from this already sorted and prepared buffer really takes no time at all. Okay, so this is what we see here. That blocking operator can then very quickly, very swiftly produce all the subsequent rows. Only the first row really is uh, really costly. Okay, we could then uh, say maybe request the next three rows, and this will be very quick. All of this would be would be answered from the uh, prepared buffer internally. We could uh, well scroll backwards. Okay, and uh, well explore the query result in this particular fashion. All right, so, but uh, as, uh, as I told you before, the discrepancy in times in delivering the first row and in delivering all the subsequent rows, this uncovers the blocking behavior of the sort operator inside the plan. Right, all right, so let's close the pipeline, deallocate the plan, the intermediate sort buffer, for example, and then close that sequence of statements that we have investigated. I've brought one other example of this type of this uh, of this kind with me, and uh, it's this particular uh, example. Okay, so that's a union all example, uh, a binary operator that assembles its overall result from this left hand side and this right hand side lag of queries. Well, you can see that uh, these uh, these lags both use the generate series here. The generate series uh, set returning function. This will deliver the result, uh, the values one, two, three in order. Bind them to i, and we will just return them. This will be a single column table of three entries containing the values uh, one, two, three. Okay. And the right hand side leg, well, actually, it would uh, do something very similar. It would would do something very similar, but uh, well, it would first order it would first um it would first produce a whole slew or a slew of rows almost five million rows almost uh, five million rows here almost five million rows uh, we were counting down from five million down to four here yeah? so almost five million rows will be produced in descending order we would then order these almost 5 million rows in ascending order again. So we are artificially generating some work here, some work that will be implemented by a blocking sort operator. Okay, only to then uh, only deliver the first three rows here, the first three rows in uh, of this ordered uh, result. Of course, we have to perform the sorting first to identify which are the first three rows that uh, would indeed be uh, delivered by this uh, by the sort operator in the plan. So both of these, both of these uh, uh, legs will deliver exactly three rows. This row, this will deliver the values one, two, three. This will deliver the values four, five, six. But well, the right hand side leg has to do considerably more work to deliver its three rows, to contribute its three rows to this union all operator. So let's uh, have a look at the plan that is being generated here. All right. So at the top of the plan, we find the append operator and the append operator is indeed the plan operator that represents the union all on the SQL side of things. 
And well, that append would be a binary operator with a left-hand side and the right-hand side lag. The left-hand side lag, well, it would simply uh, implement the invocation of the generate series here. A function scan would be like a sequential scan, but the values are not delivered from a file. They are delivered from the invocation of the set returning function. All right, and the right-hand side would, of course, also invoke the generate series here. That would deliver almost 5 million rows. These almost 5 million rows, here you can see the number of rows, actually. These almost 5 million rows will be fed into a blocking sort operator to bring these rows into ascending order. This is the artificial slew of work that we are producing here, only to then only uh, deliver the first three of these sorted rows, as you can see here. All right, so there is some asymmetry between the legs of the union all, and this is actually the entire point of this particular demonstration. OK, so let's uh, start a sequence of statements again so that we can declare a cursor. And now I'm declaring, uh, declaring a cursor for just this asymmetric union or query. OK, right. So, uh, well, I think it would be quite instructive for you to uh, think about what timings do you expect? What timings do you expect for these six fetch next calls that I will issue in a few seconds? Please have a think about uh, the uh, the timings that you expect now that you've seen the plan, now that you've seen that one of the legs of the union all is based on the blocking sort operator. And uh, well, let's see what happens for the first row that is being uh, returned. Okay, that's the i value 1. The i value 1 obviously is contributed by the left hand side of the lag. And as you can see, it really responded immediately. Okay, so uh, well, yeah, this uh, makes sense. Um, the union all obviously delivers the rows of its left hand side lag first. Well, it could deliver the right hand side lag first, the union all does not implement any ordering of rows or something. Uh, well, what we can see now that union all indeed delivers the left hand side the first argument of its uh, of its uh, of its two arguments first indeed, and well it could de deliver the first ve the first row immediately. I think it will be able to deliver the second row immediately, and it will deliver the third row immediately. All of this takes almost no time. Not now. What will happen with the fourth fetch here? Now the left hand side. The cheap left-hand side has delivered all its contents, nothing else to fetch there. The union all will now ask the right-hand side to deliver its contribution. And, uh, well, let's see what happens. All right, so this takes some time. The blocking sort operator does its job. And uh, before it can return the first value here, the first value four here, it has to consume all the almost 500, five, uh, 5 million rows of its input to perform the sort to identify the smallest i values. Indeed, these smallest i values are generated last by this tricky generate series that we were using. This produces four last and 5 million first. So uh, indeed, uh, all of this input had to be consumed and sorted before we could produce the fourth row of the overall union all result. Now what will happen for the fifth fetch next? I think it should be immediate, right? Because we are answering uh, the next request, hitting the right hand side from the intermediate buffer that the sort has produced. Uh, well, we can immediately deliver rows from that particular buffer. And uh, that's what we see here. Uh, the sixth row should be delivered immediately and uh, well, if we dig request another a seventh row, there will be no further rows there. Okay, so we have requested the entire result. There's only six rows, two times three. We have seen the entire result. Time to close the pipeline. Time to end this sequence of statements. All right, so I think that's rather instructive and gives you some insight into the internal implementation of these operators and how they are implementing the Volcano Iterator Style, AP, style API, which is, uh, well, which is quite, has quite the advantages in many scenarios. 
before we close this video and we close the chapter, let's briefly reflect on the Volcano Iterator Style Model because it indeed has its costs. Uh, well, given that uh, all of these operators in the Volcano Style Protocol only deliver their next row, well, we have to keep these operators alive until they have delivered their last row or until we uh, send close to close them uh, and free them uh, explicitly. So all of these multiple operators are active at one time in a sense. All of them sit there ready for the, uh, uh, for the next, next call to arrive and ready to deliver their next row. All right, so the intermediate state of all of these operators uh, may be very small individually, but uh, all of these operators that are active, that remain active, have to uh, have to uh, have their intermediate state available. And of course, the sizes of these memory uh, of these memory sources may aggregate. Uh, blocking operators in such a plan, inside such a plan, hash tables, sort buffers, well, all of, all of these might aggregate and add to some rather substantial overall intermediate state that has to be kept around. Well, the Volcano Iterator State API is rather function call heavy. We would send open calls, then we would send well, hundreds, thousands, if not millions of uh, next calls, then close calls, maybe further open calls in the inner of a nested loop and so on. So this is really function call heavy a function call heavy protocol and function calls come with their own overheads. So function calls have to be prepared. Pre -prepared. Uh, well, uh, of course, the CPU has to has to invoke the particular piece of code. That particular piece of code might not be available in the CPU instruction cache because uh, only recently we have uh, focused on a completely different operator before we were sent to the next upstream operator inside the plan. So. Uh, uh, the CPU will in, uh, execute some instructions in one particular operator only to be forwarded to execute some instructions in another operator only to then return to uh, perform some more instructions in the previous operator and so forth. This would lead to a rather substantial CPU instruction cache footprint. And uh, it's very unlikely that the entire code of all the participating operators inside a plan would find their space and place inside the CPU instruction cache. So these frequent switches between code blocks of the participating operators is not friendly regarding modern CPUs and their instruction caches. Right, so, uh, well, there is, of course, the, Vec the Volcano style uh, API has its uh, salient points and uh, it's not easy to simply do away with uh, with this uh, with the volcano iterator model, uh, only because of uh, these disadvantages that it has on modern CPU architectures. So what you will find in modern RDBMSs, and there is a particular RDMS that would be the uh, granddaddy of uh, these type of systems, which is the vector wise system, or also known as X100 now, or times 100, however you want to uh, pronounce that. That would be a DBMS that implements the volcano style iterator model, okay, but as the na name already suggests, it would not operate these, uh, the participating operators in a row by row fashion, but it would operate them in a vector by vector fashion. So a whole vector of rows, a whole vector of rows, exactly so many rows as will fit into the CPU data cache. A whole vector of rows will be produced on the next next call to uh, to any operator. So we would spend some time inside the operator. We would, uh, of course, uh, and then benefit from uh, CPU instruction locality. We would spend some time in the operator and would only leave it when it has produced a whole vector of rows that we can then return to the parent to the calling operator, which will also do its thing on this whole vector of rows and pass on a whole vector of rows from operator to operator. So we uh, would operate on a vector by vector and not on a row by row basis, trying to save some of the function call overhead and trying to benefit from uh, instruction cache locality. 
it's a sort of middle ground that we strike between full materialization and pipelining. There's a very recent system that is super interesting because of many aspects, uh, but it's called Umbra, uh, which I think is well, m maybe uh, one year old by now. Uh, it's a really, very recent system and it uh, implements exactly this particular idea. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a merger of the, the full materialization, the vector-based operation and the volcano-style operation uh, that takes into account the characteristics of modern CPUs and caches. And I think uh, that will be the way forward for the, well, for the uh, near future. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I think I think that's a nice closure for this chapter 13 because it represents a merger uh, between the two ideas that we have uh, presented in this chapter, full materialization and volcano style on demand evaluation. Okay, I think that should be it for this particular chapter. This is chapter 13 and it's the next to last chapter. Chapter 14 on query optimization will be the last chapter in this semester in this particular course. I'm already busy preparing the slides for that and all the supporting material. I think uh, that should be ready to go maybe tomorrow, maybe in uh, two or three days. And uh, well, I'm all ready to set up the camera and microphone, the green screen and, uh, and uh, produce those videos for you. Uh, looking forward to that. I hope you will stick around until then for the next chapter. Take care guys and see you soon.